Hello, welcome back to the Cube. We are here for our media day here in the New York Stock Exchange, part of our Cube Studio East. It's our new access points, our point of presence. It's where the community in New York is connecting with our Silicon Valley community and opening up a global network of, of people, content, relationships, all bringing to you. We are here about to wrap up with the closing bell. John Griffin is the co-founder and chief revenue officer of Meter M3 TER. M3 TER. E, we all know if you're a system admin in E, a three is an E, so it's meter with the three. John, great to have you on theCUBE. Thanks for coming on. The bell's going to go off, so we'll pause and enjoy the bell ringing ceremony, which I love every, every time of the day when it goes off. It's just like they get the gavel out of the closing bell, too. They don't do that in the opening. I mean, this is a new experience for me. I'm enjoying every second. What do you think? For having me. Not a bad set here, huh? I mean, it's incredible. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Uh, the people here are great, and and New York represents the stock exchange represents to me the center of global capitalism, and and oh, what I'm really into is how the tech world is becoming global, and and, and you guys have a great product opportunity. Um, you guys got a great product market fit with your product. I want to get into it, um, but the world is changing. You guys are right where the puck is coming. It just sticks around. If you're playing hockey, and you're like Wayne Gretzky, ready to score the goals. Um, you guys are doing really interesting usage-based platform for companies. Take a minute to explain what Meter does. We'll get into it. Yeah, I mean, let me first explain where the idea came from. Um, software, you know, often they spend nearly their entire effort or energy on building. Hold on, hold on, hold on. This is the, the countdown in 10 seconds. We're going to start in 30 seconds. This is the, the your stock exchange CACI ever built. Vigilant is not about to close. The bell will ring, and there we go. All right, New York Stock Exchange closing down media day here. Market is closing. Always a fun moment. I'm privileged. <laughs> Here comes the gavel. It bound pound the gavel. There he goes. Slap. Oh. I'm waiting for the photo op. Okay, good. All right, so back to what you guys do. Meter. Yeah, so I was just explaining the idea, and it it's really was based on an observation that software companies, they spend all their efforts building phenomenal product, uh, and often at the expense of how they're going to monetize that product. But when you look at kind of other industries like telco, they would place equal uh, footing to both the product itself and how they're going to monetize it. So when a telco starts off, they would uh, kind of treat equally the building of the operational support system and their business support system, uh, which is the kind of monetization element. But software companies don't do that. It's often an afterthought. And so when they get successful, they suddenly have to struggle to kind of catch up. So Meter's vision is to provide them with that state-of-the-art business support system capability. So getting them ready to monetize at scale seems to be a big thing. We're certainly metering and usage is great for APIs, is great for which NAI is going, it's great for cloud. Everyone wants to buy by the drink, right? Now it's buy by the sip. T totally. <laughs> so so like, when you think about it, the genesis of our idea was really when we were back at AWS. Uh, Griffin and I were both there after being acquired uh, uh, by them. And really I was blown away by the kind of business support system capability that they had. Um, uh, and they were able to leverage that throughout all of their organization to increase performance and deliver value. I was really, really impacted by that. And of course, AWS are really the pioneers of utility computing, which is 100% usage-based. Um, as opposed to seat-based, which was, say, pioneered by something like Salesforce. So we'll kind of come back to that in a second. And Griffin and, and my, yeah, we're both uh, named Griffin, by the way, which uh, confuses. <laughs> Griffin's his first name, your co-founder. Yeah. You're John Griffin. He's Griffin. That's right. So it confuses and amuses both, both uh, at the same time. Um, so, so really our kind of epiphany was that software in the future was all going to move this way. And so when you say where, you know, uh, we are where the puck is going to, that's very kind. As a founder, you don't always see it that way. You, you feel like you're not kind of <laughs> paddling coaster. fast enough, <laughs> you know, not paddling fast enough. But, but genuinely, yeah, it was, it was an observation really that nearly all software was going to head this way. But that they hadn't, and this was going to essentially... Uh, expose the lack of investment in the business support system capability. 
uh, that they have put in place. Um, and that really our mission was to fix that. Um, we, we figured we could fix it. We were inspired by what we learned at Amazon and uh, we knew we could fix it. So we came out of there to do exactly that. And you guys have pretty good backers. How much have you raised? What stage are you? And who are the investors? Yeah, we do. We've got phenomenal backers. Uh, we raised uh, uh, over the course of Seed and Series A uh, about 32 million, uh, roughly, maybe, maybe just slightly less, uh, being accurate. Um, and we got it from really, really good investors. First, our first investor was Kindred Capital, which is a kind of seed investor based out of London. Um, and then that was followed up fairly quickly by Union Square Ventures here in New York, which we're very, very happy to have on board as an investor. And then by Insight Partners, another one we're really extremely proud to have. And then uh, Notion Capital, based out of London, uh, one of the foremost technical investors in London, uh, came in and led our Series A with the others following on. Um, so business is going great. It's advancing. We're hitting all our numbers and our metrics have started to look really, really good. So we're gearing up to go to the next round, you know, uh, soon, shall we say, being big. All right. Well, the Cube comes. The Cube can get a little participate in that round. We don't have a venture fund yet. If we did, we would they invest. You want to. You want to. <laughs> but let's talk about the metrics, because one of the things in talking to Craig, who runs North America for you guys, I've known from the Dell days, um, was saying that you guys have really strong traction. Talk about some of the metrics you're hitting on right now um, that give you confidence you guys, are, you guys are in the right direction. Sure. You know, it's funny because this isn't the first time that Griffin and I had done this together, but, but nevertheless, you still find it takes some time to learn the right lessons and to really understand your market, what it is you're doing for your market, and how you're different from anybody else that might be playing alongside you. And it, this was no different. Uh, and so what I would say is, yes, we do have great traction, but it's really starting to take off since we, I think, have more recently over the last 12, 14 months really understood who our ideal customer is. And it's a software company that is making at least 100 million themselves in annual recurring revenue. And the reason for that is interesting. It's because at that stage, they have made solid investments in their business support systems. Let's call that the quote cash stack. You know, they, they'll inevitably have Salesforce to support the front office, you know, to support customer management, really order processing. And they'll have invested in a, a finance system, shall we call them. Maybe it's a NetSuite or, or a bigger one like Oracle Cloud or even SAP. And so these investments, I mean, these are immovable objects. This is the infrastructure. Infrastructure. And this is the quote to cash infrastructure, which essentially builds the business. of so revenue model. The revenue, exactly. Yeah. And so our observation, our critical observation, was that these systems aren't going anywhere. So we should not be trying to replicate the functionality that exists in those platforms. Rather, we should be looking at the pieces they're missing, which actually is sometimes called the messy middle, the metering and rating, the t ingesting huge, vast volumes of data near real time and applying the pricing rules to it and then sending that data to the systems that need it, which is back to the front office system yeah. to inform salespeople to the finance system, to power invoicing. To yeah, power you're a big data pipeline system. Yeah, exactly. You're pipelining it, data exactly. and putting it in the where it needs to go, the right place, the right know, API. Exactly. We've got a lot of cloud infrastructure customers, but inevitably we look like one. You know, we're built on AWS where we came from. A lot of us came from there. Um, and we leverage an awful lot of those low-level services. And yes, a large portion of our product is a data pipeline product. What I find interesting is that uh, we're seeing this Cloud 2.0, I call it Cloud 2.0. Hate, Amazon hates that word because it's really, in their words, still cloud. But th it is changing. The ecosystems are getting smarter, more connected, and more functional with each other. But yeah, SaaS vendor, self-service, no problem, that's growing. Yeah, click, pay by the subscription, pay by the seat, but they're still paying by the drink and by the sip to Amazon. Okay, but now they're moving to become a platform. So you have this platformization of the ecosystem just as evolution. So they're Very turning into usage-based. So I see a shift where we're moving from SaaS self-service by the seat or monthly service, but to, hey, I'm going to hit other services. I got to start metering because now the SaaS companies might hit a language model, Anthropic. It might hit SageMaker. It might hit uh, open AI, my, so I'm going to, or the cube AI, or, I see I see language models potentially being usage-based, because oh. that's a good way to make money. Why very wouldn't you? So, very much This so. is just one of many I mean, well, you usage 
you, points. You, you probably hit on the biggest tailwind uh, or, or wave when we, we like to use the surfing analogy internally, um, which is really the, you know, AI, the top, everybody's talking about it, it's here, so it's, the money it's been is, here for ages. That's where the money is. It's where the money is. But I, you see, I think actually if we, if we could look at an example that really brings this into perspective for anybody listening into this, at a Salesforce. Salesforce uh, pioneered seat-based pricing around about back in 2000s. You know, they, they were at the vanguard of it. Everybody followed. That was subscription pricing yeah. thereafter. They were cloud before cloud. They're, they invented this SaaS practically. <laughs> or at least we'll give them credit yeah, for it. It was a lot yeah. alongside them. Um, but to hear them come out with, uh, you know, it's just a dream force, really, that a new product that they've uh, launched called Agent Force, which is really an AI-based uh, software solution. By the way, that's coming out of their data cloud. We had extensive coverage of that. Oh, uh, right. Exactly. Oh, data cloud equals data. It's your business. Exactly. It is our business. And so the fact that they announced that they were going to deploy uh, value-based pricing for this new software it was incredible. It, it caused quite a storm in the industry. Because if Salesforce are doing this, clearly that's a signal for the rest of us, especially when they pioneered the seat-based pricing model. Now, the reasons for this are obvious, and you've touched on some of them. Um, like when you think about it, this agent force, okay, it's, if it's good at its job, it's actually going to reduce the amount of agents or seats that are required. And therefore, if you're charging on that, you're going to make less money. So they were forced. They really had to change the business yeah. model. And that's the impact that AI is going to have. And by the way, itself. that's a smart move on their part, because how do you enforce seat-based pricing on agents when there's thousands of agents turning up and turning down all the time? You can't. That's just too hard. So you got to go to the volume game. Y yes. Right? I mean, it, 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 well, at or, scale with a system like Meter, you can uh, do it at scale, you know, up seats and down seats and prorate them, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, you guys do that too? Yes, yes. We. Oh, actually, it's an important point, and thanks for the opportunity to say it. Uh, what we find is, is that, like, if you're going to sit in the middle of somebody's front office and back office, you don't want that to be overcrowded. So there were some other players, for yeah. example, in the subscription space that you just kind of go, Ooh, we need to be better at that too, so that a customer, our customers, only really need one system to join these two things together. So as a result, we become much better at that. Yes, we do a lot of subscription-based pricing also. Well, Sean, great to have you on in your community between New York and Dublin. Yeah, that's that where home the, <laughs> the native tongue, got a nice accent there. Um, got to love that ecosystem. That's been quite the tech scene in Dublin as well. I mean, give it, give it a feel for what's going on there in the tech scene. We know all the big players are there. Um, what's it like in, in Dublin right now from a tech scene standpoint? Incredible. Um, you know, I, I would have to give credit where credit is due. It is largely due to a very ambitious group of people uh, that encouraged collaboration with the states uh, and made it very attractive for the large tech companies here to uh, headquarter uh, there in Dublin. They're incredibly successful at doing this. And as a result, you know, you've got great companies like uh, Amazon, Microsoft, all of them, uh, Meta, you name it, Google, Apple. They're all there and headquartered there. And as a result of that, they uh, essentially employ everybody they can that is that, native to Ireland. You got a pulse and no tech, let's go. You know, like they employ <laughs> everybody that can be employed from Ireland. So there's a yeah. lot of people uh, coming in, you know, from uh, neighboring countries and, 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 and even beyond to basically work for these companies. So it's fantastic for our economy. And actually, it's probably what's contributed us to being in, you know, the top 10. Yeah, and uh, it's a great, GDP great, city, great city, too, kind of like New York. All right, your vision going forward, you guys are hitting your metrics. B rounds eminent. Yeah. Um, no doubt about that. It's pretty clear. Congratulations on your success uh, and continued success. What's your vision, you and Griffin, John and Griffin, John and Griffin and Griffin uh, and team? What's the vision as you look forward to steady state scale? What's that look like for you and what should people be looking for? Well, we've got two goals that make up that vision. The first goal is to succeed in this automation and give companies a business support system they need. You know, automate their code to cash processes fully uh, and allow them to do that. But really, uh, goal two is arguably more interesting. And it's to take all of that usage data and turn it into a really valuable asset for the company. So we're working on this right now and a product coming out. So for finance teams, for example, we do forecasting, which is notoriously difficult. Um, for sales teams, we alert them to new upsell opportunities or potentially churn risks. And for deal desks within companies and pricing professionals, yeah. we allow them to experiment with new pricing models. 
um, and to uh, roll out new ones um, and to, you know, just design better prices. Business intelligence is a natural extension. Yeah. I mean, I can imagine if I'm not using the product, I might be uh, uninstalling it soon, right? I mean, if, if I'm a company, don't you want to know that someone's not using your product? You have to know that. I mean, that's like you, you, 101. You have to Hello. know that. You have to know that. And, you know, there's no trapping people in like the <laughs> like the gyms do yeah. on an yeah. annual basis. You yeah. know, your annual fee yeah. and, and, you know. Churn is huge. Well, churn can be. Yeah. But uh, products that tend to adopt usage-based modeling first are sticky by definition. Um, and inevitably, what we see proving out on the market is, is that they're growing faster than their subscription counterparts. Yeah, and they got to have that intelligence. All right, well, great to have you on the Cube. Thanks for coming on. You're so welcome. Yeah. Thank you very, very much, John. It was well, a great to have you in the Cube network. You're out, Cube alumni. Okay, this is the Cube. We are here at our East Coast access points, the Super Node. Maybe we get to Dublin and put a new node in Dublin soon. Let's put that on the, on the list. Robust Tech City, all the tech coverage. Go to siliconangle.com, of course, cube.net. Check out the Cube research. Dot com. Of course, if you want to see all of our videos that have been converted into vector embeds and neural network format, check out thecubeai.com. Type in a query. All of our data is there. All the insights are there for your, your consumption. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE here in the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for watching.